Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today is the 13th of February of 2021, and I'm going to be completely honest with you here and mention that this particular article that I'm going to be looking at today is going to be looking at hypothermia. And again, these authors are talking about 34 degrees Celsius in COVID period. Wow, I felt like I was just dictating there. I said period. But you know what? It's kind of humorous, so I'm just going to let that slide. <laughs> uh, anyway, not like that. You guys know I'm an actual human being and not a machine or something like that. But this article is more than anything for entertainment and conceptualizing things purposes rather than actual data because there's no actual randomized control trial or feasibility trial or anything like that looking at using hypothermia in COVID patients. I'd like to say that the paper that I'm using as a citation for this particular podcast was published on the 30th of January in the journal Critical Care. The title of the article is Cheap and Simple, Could It Get Even Cooler? Mild Hypothermia and COVID-19. As always, I recommend that you read the article for yourself and do not trust me. It's completely free for you to download. It's down in the show notes. It's on my website. You could get it. Read that. Don't trust me. But I would also like to tip my hat to the authors from Brazil for the time they took to create this very interesting article that honestly provided me a lot of uh, a lot of enjoyment. I guess I guess this is just me being a nerd, and I, I really like the fact that you guys are being nerds with me on this journey. So I have discussed ad nauseum before that the two main issues with COVID nineteen are the hypercoagulable state as well as the pro-inflammatory state that we commonly call a cytokine storm. For the hypercoagulable state, we know that there are numerous studies currently ongoing that are looking at different anticoagulation strategies as well as antiplatelet strategies to attempt to mitigate poor outcomes in COVID-19 patients. For example, I give all my COVID-19 patients a baby aspirin, and again, this is not medical advice, it's just telling you what I'm doing, based on a article, a retrospective article from, I think it was called uh, analgesia and anesthesia, something like that. Again, I covered it before. And I put a lot of my patients on full dose anticoagulation. But with regards to the pro-inflammatory state, we have noticed that there's an increase in interleukin-1, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, as well as other cytokines out there. We tend to measure, those of us who don't have the ability to, you know, measure these things because they sound like they're expensive. We measure other common routine labs to see how patients are doing, which include ferritin as well as C-reactive protein. Now, currently in our armamentarium, which I love saying that word, for fighting for COVID, we have definite knowledge from the recovery trial that corticosteroids, including dexamethasone in the uh, recovery trial and methylprednisolone in the study that came out of Iran show a decrease in mortality in COVID-19 patients. If you keep up with what I'm doing, um, as recently as two days ago, the recovery group that's out of the UK went ahead and published a study. Well, it's not peer-reviewed yet, but they, you know, they put it online. They put up a study that has shown that tocilizumab in conjunction with corticosteroids could also decrease mortality in COVID-19 patients, which is pretty cool because, again, we want to save all lives as possible. But the truth is that there may be other anti-inflammatory mechanisms and medications such as melatonin, colchicine, and again, now with colchicine, there's outpatient data as well as inpatient data that show it works, but whatever, I guess people don't want to use it vitamin C, as well as other therapies that could potentially work synergistically with dexamethasone and tocilizumab to decrease mortality in our COVID-19 patients who end up in the IC. The authors of this particular study and I both agree that there should be a multifaceted approach for managing patients with COVID, and this multifaceted approach would hopefully lead to better outcomes. I think it's going to be way too difficult to find out that, for example, vitamin C or melatonin uh, by themselves change any outcomes. Maybe, you know, they might go ahead and change the number needed to treat from being, say, 16 for the tocilizumab plus, uh, plus corticosteroids might decrease from a number needed to treat a 16 down to 12. Who knows? But the truth is that nobody is doing the trials looking at it. So for those people who are gung-ho about it, nobody's doing the trials. For the people who are complete naysayers, they're not doing the trials either. But I digress. The issue is that 
organizing tri trials that are sufficiently powered to show these outcomes are quite challenging. And part of the good thing about this and again, this leads back to me just being an optimistic person, is the fact that as of today, being the middle of February of 2021, the numbers of patients presenting to our respective hospitals with COVID is declining. Again, that's a good thing. But this also means that the chances of completing trials is going to be decreasing by the day. And again, that's a good thing. But anyway, the argument made by the authors includes the fact that they believe that mild therapeutic hypothermia could be part of this multifaceted approach that, again, it also has some limited risks to it. To define what the authors meant by mild hypothermia, they mean that the patient should stay between 34 to 35.9 degrees Celsius. And they feel that a target of 34 degrees Celsius with small fluctuations sustained for 48 hours seems to be pretty feasible. The authors also offer a multifaceted approach as to how using mild therapeutic hypothermia could help out certain components such as inflammation, the respiratory system, the cardiovascular system, renal function, hemostasis, as well as infections. This is all in junction how th hypothermia could work in COVID patients. With regards to inflammation, the authors state that therapeutic hypothermia will, will suppress excuse me, the inflammatory phenomenon that we see in our patients. They mention that different interleukins, such as interleukin-6, interleukin-1, tumor necrosis factor alpha, that these are all decreased when a patient is undergoing hypothermia. But at the same time, it helps increase the production of interleukin-10. To me, these all sound like favorable effects of therapeutic hypothermia in our patients. With regards to the respiratory effects, the authors admit that most of the gains are theoretical or experimental, so therefore we really do not know if they will work in practice. But amongst the benefits that they describe is a decreased metabolic rate, which will decrease the PaCO2, which is the carbon dioxide, produced by our patients. The authors honestly get far more into it than I'm willing to get into it at this time, but they discuss how hypothermia could increase the PF ratio in our patients and help them oxygenate a little bit better. Amongst the cardiovascular improvements that could potentially be seen with therapeutic hypothermia, the authors state that myocardial contractility, systolic function, as well as blood pressure typically improve with the hypothermia. But they do also say on the flip side that one can see a decrease in cardiac output, and this is due to a decrease in the heart rate as well as mild di diastolic dysfunction with, that one can see with the hypothermia. So that's something that we have to keep an eye on. Now, the renal benefits are also hypothetical, and this is where they state that, and I'm going to quote, therapeutic hypothermia might be capable of attenuating kidney histopathological injury in systemic inflammation. In other words, the kidneys won't get as beat up as they normally do during COVID, because as we know, COVID is, well, it just has a lot, a lot of inflammation. That's a, that's a very medical way of saying things, right? A lot, a lot of inflammation. Anyway, I digress. One of the more interesting components of this theory of using therapeutic hypothermia includes that of improving hemostasis in these patients. I guess hemostasis may or may not be the right word, but rather getting rid of the prothrombotic state that we so commonly see in COVID-19. Hematology, to be completely honest with you, is not one of my strongest suits in medicine, but those of us who work in the ICU know that when we cool patients down to 33 degrees Celsius, they tend to be more, uh, more excuse me, they tend to be far less coagulopathic than they are at baseline. I mean, this is one of the reasons why a brain bleed, for example, and patients that are actively bleeding after cardiac arrest are not cooled down to 33 degrees Celsius. I honestly do not have access to the TEG device. Um, you know, TEG is the thromboelastogram at my facility, but we've all seen different wonky patterns in COVID patients from these fancy institutions that have the capacity to show that. And again, TEG is not something that's necessarily fancy, but you see it a lot in trauma and my hospital is not a trauma hospital, so I digress. The authors postulate that it is plausible that therapeutic hypothermia, quote, reduces deviations from hemostasis throughout the whole spectrum of coagulopathy. 
and they sort their they sort their excuse me they state their sources for making this claim. One of the other things that really caught my eye is the part of infections where they state that this is another benefit of therapeutic hypothermia. And to simplify in my own words what the authors wrote, and again, you should definitely read what they wrote for yourself, therapeutic hypothermia should bring down both IL-1 and IL-6, excuse me, just IL-6. And IL-6 helps viruses replicate. So therefore, if IL-6 is decreased, then COVID virus replication should be mitigated. At least that makes sense. The authors also discuss how therapeutic hypothermia could potentially help out with secondary infections. But to this, I kind of like squint my eyes a little bit, scratch my head, because my question is honestly, how long do we have to keep the patient cool to prevent secondary infections? In fact, from a clinical standpoint, you know, when will we get started and how long will we even continue the, the hypothermia? And the truth is, how, how many patients do we have to enroll to actually, you know, go ahead and prove this in a... So to put all this together, my personal take on this article and on hypothermia and COVID is that it's a very cool concept and I definitely appreciate the authors digging into it. Personally though, I'm not gonna be implementing this strategy in my practice. I'd like to wait for more data. To be completely honest with you, after the results of several trials looking at therapeutic hypothermia in cardiac arrest patients for the sake of neurologic protection, I rarely use it in my practice. I use a normal thermia protocols where, you know, you keep the patient to a temperature of 36 degrees Celsius and avoid fever at all costs. I guess a hybrid way of sorts to use these types of therapies and a hypothermia therapy of sorts in COVID patients would include the utilization of cooling blankets to avoid fever, as well as scheduled Tylenol, which at the end of the day is a good way to do multimodal analgesia for our patients who are mechanical ventilation anyway. So it's kind of like a win-win of sorts. Obviously, that's not a medical recommendation. And if you do use scheduled acetaminophen in your critically ill patients, you're already cognizant of the patient's liver function. And, you know, you're not going to shred their liver because some of these people just go ahead and do so. So I'd like to know what your thoughts are on using hypothermia for COVID. Obviously, these patients are going to need to be sedated and intubated because you're not going to cool somebody down to 34 degrees when they're just like looking at you and sucking wind on high flow. But do you honestly think that this is a strategy that could be used in the future? I'd like to hear your thoughts and thank you so much for supporting my work. If you're watching this on YouTube, a thumbs up will be appreciated. If you are listening to this on a podcast, if you leave me a five-star review, that would be awesome if you're on my webpage or something like that. Thank you very much for your support. All right, guys. Have a great day. Bye.